Okay, so I thought what I'd do in this video is I'd give a, a do a tier list of, of the games that I played in 2021. I played about uh, 108 games, 108 different types of games in 2021, and um, so that would be too long to do one list. So I decided to split the uh, split this into two different tier lists. Uh, this first one is the games that I played primarily online, either. Um, Board Game Arena or um, on an app or something like that. And then the second list will be games that I played over the board in person. So there's 42 games for this first list and there's um, somewhere between 60 and 70 games for the second list. And I'm gonna try to keep my comments to about eight seconds per game so that uh, this isn't a longer than about a seven minute video. So that's the goal here. And I will say probably I'm gonna be more positive in the second list than in the first list because uh, you know the ones on the first list are games primarily that I own and therefore there's a selection bias going on. Um, and sometimes online I will try out a game and quickly realize I never wanna play it again. So there, there'll be some games like this, like that on the list. And they're roughly in alphabetical order. They might be perfectly in alphabetical order here, I'm not sure. So first game is Seven Wonders. Seven Wonders I do own in person, um, but I have played it mostly online. And I think it's actually much, my, my opinion of the game has gone up since I've been playing it online because it's so fast on Board Game Arena, great implementation. Still probably not one of my favorite games, but I have absolutely no complaints about it. So I would probably put it on the B tier. Abyss is a game that I discovered this year um, it's a decent game. It's, uh, it's a little bit repetitive, I think, and it's hard to play online asynchronously. It's, it's much better to play synchronously. I doubt it will ever become a favorite, but I don't hate the game, so I would put it on C tier. Agricola, I've played once in person. Um, I rage quit it online. I really don't get this game. I've never really found a UA Rosenberg game that I like, uh, even though it should be the kind of game that I like, but I have no idea what's going on in Agricola. It seems so long before you get to do anything that it's such a punishing game. I'll, I'll put it on D tier. I have respect for the designer and the fact that people love this game, but I don't get it. Alhambra was a game um, I was interested in purchasing at one point, not knowing much about it other than kind of like the idea of the theme, like city building games, tile laying games, but um, it was kind of a disappointment to me. It just seemed a little bit random. Um, it's nice that it goes up to six players. It's very fast to play online. I like it better than Agricola, but probably not as good as the Abyss. Uh, Amiitis, or M, yeah, Amiitis, I played a couple times online. Um, it's, it didn't really excite me, but I didn't really hate it either. I would put it on the C tier around Abyss. Beyond the Sun is an interesting one. I'm not sure how, you know, how I'm gonna feel about this game after I play it more times, but I definitely wanna play it more times. It's got a great theme. I love science fiction themes. The tech tree is really interesting. Um, I think it's tiny epic galaxies with the, the way that planets work, but done in, in a much more interesting way. I'm not sure the techs feel all that different. I, I Pretty much the techs are variations on either putting spaceships out or getting resources or researching technologies. So I can't, I'm just not sure that it's got the variety and the, and the staying power, but every time I've played it, I've really, really enjoyed it. And I've had some thinky games of it. So I'm gonna put it up on A tier. And my prediction is that it will get go down from there. But um, so far, so good. Blue Skies, on the other hand, I clicked around on this thing. It felt very random and very uninteresting, and I can't even really put into words what the game is all about. So I'm gonna put it down on F tier. Maybe I'll try it again someday. It's not like I'd never tried it again, but I really didn't know where this game was coming from and what I was supposed to be doing. Can't Stop is an old Sid Saxon game, and it's dumb, kind of. I mean, it's a push your luck game. I'm not crazy about push your luck. It's a bunch of dice rolling, but it's addictive. And online, it's fast playing. And it's really the only game where I will just get online and play random people. Usually when I play online, I'm either playing against um, friends 
that's basic. Or I'm playing two-handed just to try out a game, playing solo against myself. I don't really like playing with strangers, but can't stop. I like playing with for some reason. You know, it's just you just can't feel bad if you lose because it's just a dice checking game. And I'll put it up on B tier. I, I would. It, it's it's not an incredible game, but it is fun. Uh, so I guess that's the point of games, right? Carcassonne is a game that I own. I just haven't really... Maybe I played it once in person this year. Um, it's, uh, it's not a favorite of my game group uh, or really of my family members, but I like it. I think it's a very strong game. I have one of the expansions. Online, it's very easy to play. Um, I wish I played it more, actually. This, this could almost be an A-tier game, but I'll, I'll make it a B-tier game. Uh, Carnegie. Carnegie is my kind of game in that it is uh, very strategic and there's lots of interacting mechanisms and lots of ways to score points. And I was really intrigued when I learned about the, the mechanism of how the workers move around this factory space and how that enables you to take actions. Um, that the reality of playing it, it just wasn't as fun as I thought it would be. I, the, your workers were never in the right place. And maybe there's a way to have planned ahead, but I didn't see it. Also, it's one of these games where one person selects a phase and then everybody does it. And I thought that would be fun too, trying to outguess, you know, what's my opponent gonna pick so I don't have to pick it. But the four things that you can select are so interconnected that you you basically need to do everything. So it didn't really seem like that strategic choice was, you know, whatever phase is picked, I'm happy to do, basically. Um, so I understand they're still working on the game. I, I think we played a uh, version that they were still getting feedback on. So maybe the game will get better. Maybe the improvements will make it better. But I would call it a disappointment, and I would, I would have to put it on the C tier, probably the strongest game on the C tier. Codex is a game I've only tried playing against myself. I gave up pretty quickly because I just didn't think there was a whole lot of soul to this game. Some interesting ideas, I think, but um, D tier game. Uh, what's this game? This is a Conspiracy, I think. I hope I've got this box cover right. So this is... Um, a game in the Abyss universe where you're building this pyramid and um, I guess it's not my favorite type of game, but I think I liked it a little bit. Mm, I guess I liked it about the same as Abyss. I, I would put it on C tier behind Carnegie and in front of uh, Amiitis. Deus, same kind of thing. Only played it against myself. Um, ha didn't really complete a full game. Kind of gave up on it. Um, but I think there's more to it. I think it's a game I could get to like. So I'm going to put it on C tier as a game that I just didn't give quite enough of a chance. And maybe it will be a game that I return to at some point and it, and it goes up in my rankings. Dice Forge is a favorite of our group that gets together online. It's not a game I've ever played in person. I think it'd be an interesting game to play in person since you're manipulating dice and pulling off faces and putting on other faces. Um, the game sometimes seems short, it's nine rounds, and, and the number of rounds where you're building up your dice is only a few rounds, because after that, why build up your dice if you're not gonna get to roll them a lot? Um, the, there's a lot of variability in the game. I don't know that that's a strength of the game, though, because it really slows down the game to read about all the powers of the different dice, or all the different cards that you can buy that, that will um, score you points, and get you extra resources and things like that. So I didn't love it. I like engine building games. I didn't really feel like this was a great engine builder, but for a game to go on and play when everybody knows the rules, 20 minute game online, um, it's fun. So I would put it on, probably it's worthy of being on B tier, um, right below Can't Stop. Dice Hospital is another game that we discovered recently. Another one that I would like to return to and get more plays. Um, it's, uh, it's a pretty clever game where um, your dice are, are counters representing the health of your patients and um, uh, you have to get them up to discharge them from the hospital, keep them from dying by taking various actions around, around the hospital and you're acquiring new elements to your hospital that give you better and better powers. 
Um, so I'm going to put that on B tier. I like it more than Dice Forge. I'm not sure I like it more than Can't Stop, but it's a game that could, I think, grow on me. Uh, Imhotep, another game that I've only played against myself. I think probably at some point I'll introduce it to my group because it's simple enough to learn. Again, this is another game that I had on my potential to buy wish list. And uh, uh, then when I played it, I was just underwhelmed by it. I do have Imhotep the Duel, another game I was kind of underwhelmed by. It's harmless. It's not bad. It's just not a game that I think is going to get a lot of plays and it's definitely not something that's on my to buy list anymore. So it's strong enough to be on above the D tier. Um, and I'll probably put it behind Abyss. Then we have Lewis and Clark. Lewis and Clark, I watched a video on, I read the rules on, I wanted to introduce it to my group, then another guy in my group learned the rules. And so we were all gung-ho to play it, and we played it, and very much like Agricola, I could not figure out what was going on in the game. Um, I, I was There's some, again, really neat ideas in the way that tags on cards come out and other people's tags can influence the power of your action and you've got this village where you're sending workers out and you're moving across a map and I just I just lost caring about it uh, my friend got a good engine going and he was just leaping you know lapping us on the on the board and it just felt like a game where um, I'll talk about this again, a type of game that I just hate, where you are looking for a specific card combo, and then when you got that card combo, you beat it to death. Some people love that style of game. I don't. <laughs> I like any game could be different, and there's lots of ways to score points, and you're doing this thing, and I might do this thing, and we'll see who comes out on top in the long run, as opposed to really quickly honing in on the horse that you're gonna beat for the rest of the game. That's just boring for me. So I would put this down on F tier. It just, I know people love it, but I don't ever wanna play it again. Lords of Waterdeep. Lords of Waterdeep is a game that is an app game. I own the app for this. Um, I played it a few times on the app. I've played it against other people, against the AI, although I prefer to play other people. I've also played the physical version of this. I can't remember if I played the physical version in 2021 because I don't own it, but a, a friend of my group does. And this game is brilliant. Love Lords of Waterdeep. I just think it's, when I think of worker placement games, this is very near the top of the list. It is pretty streamlined. It is, to some extent, not as thematic as, you, as I might like it to be because I like the D&D universe but I have fun every time I play it with the expansions, without the expansions. Uh, it is a top, top game for me. And I, I'd put it on S tier. I think it's, it's fantastic. And I love to play it in person too. Lost Ruins of Arnak, another um, game a lot of, getting a lot of buzz this year. Um, I've played it on Board Game Arena. I've played both boards. My uh, friend of mine just bought it. Uh, physical copy, we haven't broken that one out yet, but I look forward to doing it. Um, it's interesting because this game is another one. It's a deck builder, but it's a deck builder that's very tight. You're not putting a lot of cards into your deck. And so it might suffer a little bit from that thing that I just said about um, Lewis and Clark, that you're getting a couple of cards and you're beating them to death. But I think I've, I've had more variety of decks in Arnak and I don't really know what I'm gonna do, how, what strategy I'm gonna pursue each time. And I've had great brain-burning moments in this game where I'm trying to plan ahead and squeeze every little possible thing out of, you know, if I pick up this bonus here, this bonus here, this bonus here. I think some people hate that style of game. I like it a lot, where I can chain bonuses that I receive from this action and turn it over into this action. And um, that's the kind of thing I really like. So. I'm going to put this on A tier. I think it, it could go higher. So unlike Beyond the Sun, which I think can only go lower, <laughs> I think Arnak maybe could go higher or it might go lower. It might stay the same. I'm not sure. Luxor is an interesting game. It's by the, I think it's by the designer of Istanbul, which is a game I like a lot. And it shouldn't be a game that I like because it's, uh, it's kind of a one-trick game. I mean, there's different ways to score points. You, you're moving through this 
Egyptian pyramid, collecting artifacts, making sets of artifacts, and you're picking up. There are a few other ways to score points. How deep you go into the pyramid. It's kind of a roll and move game. You have a hand of cards. The number on the card tells you how many spaces you can move. But unlike a roll and move game, you've got multiple things that you can move. So the trick isn't like it, you have a number and you have to figure out which guy does it make sense to move with that number. And you can see what cards you have in your hand and they have to be played in a certain order. So you can plan several moves ahead. You can plan as much as three or four moves ahead in that game. So it just works way better than I th thought I would. It is not a deep, complicated game, but for something, again, one of these games you just want to get online and you just want to play something for 20 minutes when everybody knows the rules, it's, and it's very low stress. I don't mind losing that game. I don't mind, you know, I, I, I like winning the game. I can win the game, but I, I don't mind losing the game. So I would put it on B tier just because it's not, it's not an Arnak. It's not a Lords of Waterdeep, but it's become kind of a favorite of mine to play online. I don't know if I would enjoy the physical version as much. Who knows? Marco Polo 2. Marco Polo 2 is a standalone sequel to The Voyages of Marco Polo. And the first time I played The Voyages of, I own Voyages of Marco Polo, I thought it was very tight, very hard to see how you'd ever score points or do the things that you want to do, and then that game opened up for me. So, and I fell in love with Voyages of Marco Polo. Marco Polo 2 is basically the same game, but slightly less tight. And it's slightly better. <laughs> it's, it's very close. I mean, some people really like those tight games, um, and I don't mind them. I like Terra Mystica, which is a tight game, and I like Voyages of Marco Polo, but I like it a little looser than that, I think. Um, you know, Agricola is a tight game, too, and I hate it, so I guess there's no easy rule. But I think Marco Polo 2 might be one of those games that I will regret. Like, ooh, I wish I'd gotten, if I wish that had come out before I bought the original. Because I'm not sure I can justify owning both. But I think I like Marco Polo 2 a little better. Maybe it's just because it's a little bit newer. But I would put that up on A tier, probably ahead of Arnak. Um, but those two would be very close. Nanga Par uh, Parbat is a, um, an interesting uh, two-player only game. Um, I don't know if it's come out in the physical version yet, but it's been on Board Game Arena. And it's interesting. You, you take an action, you take an animal off the board, the animal will give you special powers, and everything is about manipulating the animals on the board, manipulating where your so-called hikers are on the board, collecting sets of things to try to score points, and placing things on the board to try to score points. But it has this interesting mechanism where each... There are six regions you can go to. Each region has six things in it. And if you pick the third animal in that region, that's going to send your opponent to the region number three on the board. So your move determines where your opponent goes, which is interesting. I don't know if it's a game that I love or will return to, but I would say it is... Um, it's not a bad game. I guess I would put it on the C tier which is getting pretty crowded now. Um, yeah, I'd put it maybe just behind Conspiracy. Uh, Nadavalier is another game that uh, it's a card collecting game. Um, there are, I think, five suits in the game. Each suit scores differently. Um, and I like the scoring rules. I like the ease of play. There's a bidding mechanism where you place coins down to go first to pick a card from an area. You're picking from three different areas every turn. And um, it's fun. And then you can upgrade your coins, which is really very interesting part of the game. How much do you spend on making your money stronger so your bidding is better? And how much do you just grab the cards when you get the chance? Great little decision point there. And I would put that on B tier, maybe the strongest game on B tier so far. Paris Connection is uh, one of these um, train games that involves stocks. And you're putting trains out on the map, you're extending lines of train tracks, trying to reach various cities. As this, these lines get longer and reach more cities, if you own stock in that, then you will get more points. 
and it's just not my kind of game. I, I think it's it's easy to play. I not I wasn't sure that I was really understanding which decisions were going to help me win. Um, it didn't seem like there was a whole lot of interesting things to think about on your turn. And I think some people like this shared incentive kind of thing where your move might benefit your opponents and you have to think about that, but I don't think I do. I'd rather just kind of play my own game and see if my strategy wins out in the long run. So I don't think it's a bad game. And online, I think it's easy enough to play, but I don't think it's a game that um, is going to be a favorite of mine. So I'll, I'll put it on C tier with a bunch of other games. Patchwork is a... Oh, I guess Patchwork... I guess there is a UA Rosenberg game that I'm okay with, and that's Patchwork. Uh, I don't hate it, at least. Um, I don't love it. Uh, I, you know, it's a tile laying game. I, I like those, but the whole system of collecting buttons and moving in time as a resource, I didn't really, I didn't, it didn't really fit into my my head of how to how to strategize about it. So, yeah, it's definitely another C tier game, and I guess we'll slot it in right behind Alhambra. I would play it. There's not a lot of two-player only games on Board Game Arena, as far as I know, so um, that would be one I would definitely consider. Definitely would consider introducing to somebody. Ketzel is a worker placement game. Um, again, you're collecting sets of things. Uh, it's kind of a pick up and deliver game. Um, it's got some various tracks on it. It's got a really pretty board. It's got an interesting mechanism, apparently, where you roll your meeples and how they stand up determines certain things about the turn. There are two different types of meeples that have the ability to go to different spaces. Um, so it's, it's interesting, different, but not, it's not Lords of Waterdeep when you're talking about a worker placement game. Um, I'm not sure I can put it on, I'm gonna put it on my crowded C tier again, but uh, maybe I'll put it in front of Nanga. Uh, Parbat. Hopefully we'll have enough room on this C tier here. Race for the Galaxy is the epitome of that type of thing that I hate where you are looking for certain card combos and you are beating them to death. It's supposed to be an engine builder, but it's not because, um, man, I totally lied about how little time I was going to talk about each game. That's going to be a long video after all. Uh, it's just not my style of game at all. And I like Roll for the Galaxy, but I do not like Race for the Galaxy. Um, I've rage quit this one a couple of times. I know people love it. People swear by it. Um, I prefer it very slightly to Lewis and Clark. Railroad Inc. is a uh, roll and write. It's fine. It's nothing special. Therefore, it belongs on C tier. Res Arcana, guess what? <laughs> it's, it's another Race for the Galaxy type game. Very tiny deck, very limited selection of strategies. Somebody gets a great VP combo, they beat it to death. You watch them do it for the rest of the game. It's, it's another Tom Lehman game. I guess I don't like Tom Lehman games. I don't like that style of game. Um, I don't know if I hate it more than Lewis and Clark. I think I understand it more than Lewis and Clark, so I'll put it in front of Lewis and Clark. Um, but yeah, I just, I can't deal with that game. Russian Railroads, first time I discovered it, I thought it was awesome. I thought it was amazing. And then I started to get really bored <laughs> playing it. It has this, again, kind of this shared incentive. Well, not, I don't know, shared incentive, but it's got this shared, it's a really tight worker placement game. If you need a locomotive, you better go to that space because somebody else is going to go to it. And then you'll have to wait till the next round to get one. It's one of those games. And um, it also has this, uh, so this is kind of like stocks in a game like Paris Connection where the locomotives get more valuable. So if you take a locomotive at first, then you're leaving more valuable locomotives for your opponents to select. And then this this game of chicken, like when am I going to go and take this thing and when am I not? There's also, every time you play, almost an obvious choice. If you're the first player in the round, you go to the two coin space. If you're the second player in the round, you go to the two meeples place. There's some variation to that. 
you know, or you buy an engineer. It's like, it's pretty obvious what people are going to do. Turnover becomes crucial and all that kind of stuff. Just, I just didn't see different ways to win. I didn't see a whole lot of, so it went from really borderline S tier game down, down, down in my estimation. I would leave it on B tier because I think it is, uh, still got a lot going for it, but, um, it's not, it's, it, could, it could drop from there too. Now we are playing for the first time Ultimate Railroads Async. We haven't finished it yet. Um, and so far I like it better than Russian Railroads. So that might save it for me if that ends up being a better game for me. So Grad, I just bought an app form. So I've only played this on the iPad. I've played it pass and play. I've played, I haven't played against strangers. Um, I've played against the AI. I've played the campaign mode. And I played it enough to guess that if I bought a physical copy, which I considered, I don't think I would play it a lot. But for an app, it's really amazing as an app. It's so easy to pick up and play. And um, the decisions are interesting enough um, that, you know, it's, but it's, but they're also not deep, so deep that I would want a physical copy of the game. So because I'm enjoying it a lot and enjoying it is kind of the, the reason for games, I'm going to put it on B tier. But I don't think it's necessarily as good of a game as, um, I don't know, say Carnegie or, or Quetzal or something like that. Uh, Splendor, I've played, I think I've played the physical version at least once this year, but played the app and also played on, now Board Game Arena has a version of it. And I would say it's a classic for a reason. Very easy to play, very easy to teach. It's an engine builder that I feel like you get enough out of your engine, but different people can build different engines. We can, you can go for different um, cards on the tableau. You're, you're collecting gems to pay for cards, and then the cards help give you free gems in the future. Um, and I like that kind of game. It's very streamlined, very easy to play. I understand the strategy, so it's, I don't know that I would call it an A tier game just because it's a little too simple to reach the higher levels for me, but I have a lot of respect for this game. There's kind of a few games on this tier, this B tier, that maybe I don't love, but I have a lot of respect for, like Russian Railroads, Dice Hospital, Seven Wonders, and Splendor, which I would slot in just ahead of Carcassonne, which is another one classic that I, I like, but um, respect and put it on that level for that reason. Stone Age, on the other hand, I played the physical version of that, not this year, but um, played it a few times on Board Game Arena. Stone Age, on the other hand, is right in the Lords of Waterdeep category for me. It's a classic, very easy to play, totally understand the strategy, multiple ways to win. I like the expansion. Um, and I might even like it better than Lords of Waterdeep. It's really close between these two. I go back and forth to which one of these I like better. Targi is a two-player only game. Neat mechanism for action selection. Another one where you're collecting resources and turning them into cards that are gonna score you points. You're building a tableau, very streamlined. Um, Again, there's a little bit of that game of chicken, a little bit of guessing what your opponent's going to do and reacting to it in advance. And I don't always love that in games. I find that too tense. I, it's just a thing. You know, some people love that kind of tension. And I love it in chess, but I don't love it in other types of board games when there's an engine to build and there's a tableau to build and I want to work on my area and I don't want people to get in my way. So, but... It's a great game for interaction. It's a great game for trying to outthink your opponent. So guess what? Another game that I've got a lot of respect for that I don't love myself. Um, so I'm going to put it at the end of B tier there. It seems to be a theme of this tier for me. Teotihuacan. Teotihuacan is a 10. It's my... One of my favorite games. It's probably my favorite game that I don't own that I've played and I really, really want to own. Someday I will have Teotihuacan. Um, it's a Rondell game. 
there's all kinds of tracks to go up, all kinds of interlocking systems, multiple ways to win, lots of chances for clever strategy, lots of interesting decisions. Do I level up my worker to get the bonuses? Do I keep them from leveling up so they stay very powerful? All kinds of really good stuff in Teotihuacan. It's my, that's totally my kind of game, and it's heavy enough, strategic enough, tactical enough, deep enough um, that it belongs uh, very high on my list. Ticket to Ride, um, you can almost guess where this one's going. It's a classic. Uh, it's another one that the app is super easy to play. I have played the physical version just once, I think. Um, I've never bought any of the expansion uh, maps for the app because I'm perfectly happy playing the AIs in. And it's fun playing the AIs because you don't care if you lose and you just really try to pull off. You know, keep pushing your luck, keep drawing those those root cards and hoping you already have the root built um, it's yeah the app is great it's really fun to keep playing it's a good game I don't know that it's a great game but um, and if I if it wasn't for the digital form would I love it I don't know it's kind of in that same category for me as Sagrada where I don't know that I need the physical version but the um, the app is so much so easy to keep taking out that I would I would put it on B tier. Uh, almost to the end of the list now. Takedo is I've played the physical version of this. Played with the expansions. I've played on board game arena. It's fine. It's um, it's not very deep game. Your best move is generally to go as few spaces forward on the one way track as you can. Money's tight, um, so you do have to pick a strategy, you do have to kind of stick to a strategy. Um, so it's good, it's just not a um, rich enough game, I guess, for me to get super excited about. My kids like it a lot on the app, um, and so it's probably a B tier game. I think I do like it more than, say, Carnegie, um, and I probably like it better than Targi. So I'll put it right there at the end of B tier. Trekking the World, another game that started off maybe even A tier um, and then has dropped uh, <laughs> as I've played games where I just haven't had a lot of fun, got stuck, couldn't move around the board, kept drawing cards, just looking for the right color cards, just unable to quite collect enough of these little souvenirs on the board that you use to gain points. So I, it's not hard game. It's easy to teach, easy to play. It's almost almost completely tactical. You know, what's my best move now is basically what you're dealing with. You can look ahead a little bit and you can make a little bit of a strategy with the souvenirs, but for the most part, you're just reacting to what's on the board. So it's very much at the level of Luxor for me, but I, I like Luxor much better than, well, not much better. I like it better than Trekking in the World. Um, so I think I will put Trekking the World, it's going to be in C or B. I think I'm going to put it in C tier. It is close to a B tier game though. I think I'll put it just behind Quetzal. Uh, Twa Dice. Um, we tried to play Twa once and we kind of abandoned it because we weren't really getting it and we never returned to it. So I thought I'd learn Trois Dice, thought it might be a little bit better. It was forgettable and kind of in the codex category. So I'm gonna put it on D tier behind Agricola. Zolkin, another one of the T games, I think same designers as, um, as Teotihuacan, maybe overlapping with Marco Polo too. Um, and a lot, most people like it, like very near the top of the so-called T games, but I like Teotihuacan much more than I like Zolkin. Zolkin has grown on me though. The more I've played it, the more I've kind of figured out the strategy. Yeah, the, the mechanism of leaving your workers out, planning ahead for where they're gonna be in a few turns where you can pull them back and get whatever they've earned up to that point is a great idea. I think the physical game would be even more fun having the gears in front of you. Um, but it's another one of these tight games where it can be frustrating when you get stuck not being able to do anything. Um, so it, 
it suffers a little bit from that, but I, and it's definitely gone up in my eyes, and I would say it's, uh, it's kind of equivalent to this Russian Railroad's Dice Hospital kind of zone. Um, I think I'm actually gonna put it right around here, kind of in the middle of B tier. Welcome to Super Easy to Play Online, Rolling Right, or I guess Flipping Right, um, enough interesting decisions that I like it. I like it a lot. It's really kind of in the zone of these three B-tier games. Nadavalier, Luxor, it really fits right in with those. Okay, just move my tiers around and uh, I'm going to slot it right in there in B-tier. Last game, Yokohama, and we are ending with a bang. Discovered this one on Board Game Arena. Wish I could play it every day. Wish my friends liked it as much as I do. It's such a heavy game. It's very crunchy. It's got some guts like Istanbul of how you're moving around a board to take actions, but it's also got this really neat system where the you kind of seed different spaces on the board, building up power until you're ready to activate that space. You're fulfilling contracts. You're getting bonuses left and right. Um, the only question is, how much do I love this game? Do I love this game more than Teotihuacan or less than Teotihuacan? And I'm gonna end the list with a bang and say this is my favorite game I played digitally in 2021. So, sorry I talked so long, way too long. That's my list. Uh, check back later for my list of, maybe I'll break that list into two of the games that I've played over the board in 2021.